Yep. Well, good evening. I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Urbana City Council. Will the clerk please call the roll? Council members Brown? Here. Hazen? Here. Hersey? Jacobson? Miller? Here. Roberts? Wu? Here. Mayor Marlin? Here. Next up is approval of minutes from the August 5th, 2019 meeting. Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Um, I'll second. Who was that? Was that Jared? That was me. Okay. And the second by Bill. Are there any corrections? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? That motion passes. Any additions to the agenda? Seeing none, I do have one deletion, and that would be number FD, which is the ordinance approving the liquor license. It turns out that the applicant put the uh, wrong address on the application, so we will need to redo that application. So that's um, removed from tonight's agenda. Uh, can I have a motion for that action, please? So moved. I'll moved, second it. Moved by Mary Alice, seconded by Dean. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, so FD is removed from the agenda. Um, next up is public input. I have, uh, we have several different topics on the agenda tonight, and I will have public input for several things at the time of the agenda item. I do have cards for public input now from Bishop King James and Reverend Dr. Evelyn Underwood regarding the Dr. Ellis subdivision sewer concerns. They're continually concerned about the Dr. Ellis subdivision sewer problems. Also a card from Elderus Merlin Dakar uh, expressing continued concerns about the Dr. Ellis subdivision sewer issues, equity, and historic impact. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the Urbana City Council now? Okay. The rest of you will be called at the time the agenda items come up. Um, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed that. Okay. We do have one um, request, Danielle Chinowith on UPTV. Okay. Thank you. Um, the irony is that I need to speak now because we have a IMC board meeting to talk about UPTV. So, um, my name is Danielle Shenoweth. I live at 412 West Illinois Street. Um, from 2001 to 2008, when I served on city council, I also served on Urbana Public Television Commission and also the Cable Commission. As co-founder of the Urbana Champaign Independent Media Center and organizing director at the Center for Media Justice, I have worked with public access television stations and their advocacy groups for many years. So I'm speaking to the fact that you're considering the future of public access television and considering splitting off the public access to be a fifth channel operated by a nonprofit. It's not clear if this responsibility would be accompanied by the funding to operate it or not. Um, first, I just wanted to share a little bit of history that I think could be helpful in your deliberations. Um, when I first joined the commission in 2001, I saw that UPTV was underutilized um, with a large opportunity for growth. In fact, there was almost no public access um, programming when I got on the commission. The cable franchise sets out that the city receives a 5% franchise fee. In addition, it also receives a 2% peg um, fee. That's for public education and government. In looking at the history of budget expenditures, it appeared um, at the time, this is 2001, that the PEG funds were not being segregated. And what I saw was that significant monies were actually being transferred into what is known as the VERF. The VERF is the Vehicle Equipment Replacement Fund. Um, you should look at that part of the budget because sometimes um, there's interesting things in the VERF. Um, so it was being used not to buy things for UPTV, but actually for vehicles and other things. Again, this is 2001, long time ago, not current. Um, the primary way we corrected for that is to work on more um, government bodies being broadcast. We built up the membership of UPTV, we upgraded equipment, and we did outreach. And there was really a dramatic change in UPTV at that time. Um, it did help that Mayor Satterthwaite at the time attempt to block democracy now, if you were around during that, um, during that conflict. I know there are some members of the audience who were here. 
um, and they circulated a petition, packed the city council chambers, and the, the city council took a vote to place Democracy Now! on the channel. Within five years of this kind of renewed energy, the channel actually looked very different. So I was actually part of crafting the five franchise agreement that you now have before you. Um, we actually hired a phone survey and we revealed through the survey, so much to our surprise, that UPTV was one of the most watched and most recognized channels um, that people had on their cable subscription. Um, because that franchise agreement came on the heels of some conflict over the community versus government control, there was interest at the time on having a fifth channel. That's actually how we got that in the franchise agreement. So over the 10 years since then, UPTV's management has been amazing, in my opinion. It's outreach, it's community connections. You all have great, done a great job, honestly. And in 2005, we had 477 hours of public access. 10 years later, we had 763 hours of public access. That's even after my tenure. So we grew it, and then you all grew it again. Um, so it's very easy to find UPTV. You can, it streams. You can find specific shows you want. You can move to the sections of city council you like. The technology has been great. Really, the only things UPTV lacks, in my opinion, is more space to do shows, like a studio, and more prime time spots. It could also boost community connections. Um, we could install fixed video cameras at some of the performance venues, like where the, the Rose Bowl or, or Cranert or the IMC. Um, so I understand that income after falling for several years, and this will be important to your deliberation, has actually leveled off around 150,000 per year. I looked at the last five years of income. Um, UPTV used to be able to afford two FTEs, and now you can afford one and a half. So the current budget is at $112,000, which actually leaves room for some surplus. So I, I you know, just want to say that what you have now is actually working with one and a half. Um, I know UPTV staff have been prospecting community partners, and I know the IMC has been approached, and I'm not actually speaking for the IMC because we haven't spoken as a board, so just speaking for myself this evening. Um, after advocating for a separate channel, I feel like I've changed my mind. So I think if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, I would encourage you to, this is basically my proposal, is that you should, Work with community partners, maybe open up a fifth channel, but still have the city manage it. And then if the fifth channel starts having kind of grassroots support on its own, that's, I think, a time when you have a natural partner. And honestly, I don't think it's going to be one partner. I think it's Smile Politely, IMC, Weft, Cranert, Urbana Free Library, if they're interested, you know, Rose Bowl, 25 o'clock. I think that if we're going to have a fifth channel, it should be a collaboration, and that, that should come after we have kind of breathed life into that channel. Um, and I do think that if you cut off public access and you don't have funding to go with it, it's a non-starter. There's not local funding sources for that. I know the funding source as well. So I really think that if you, you, know, if you slough it off, it's not going to be sustainable unless it has some funding. And honestly, I think 1% of the 2% is an appropriate amount of money for that. Thank you for your time, and I'm sorry for going over. Thanks so much. Thank you. Does anyone wish to address the council at this point? OK. We will move on to report from the Urbana Free Library. Celeste Schout, director, will present that. It's been another big, fabulous year at the Urbana Free Library, and my job is to come to you this time of the year and give you a report of the state of affairs of the library, and then this report, the IPLA report, Illinois Public Library Annual Report, will be put on file with the state. So I am here to 
uh, go through some of the highlights. You've got the written documents that we'll be submitting, and then I'll touch on some things here. But it's really been quite a fabulous year, and we are delighted with our partnerships throughout the community and the, the great use that the library had this year. You'll see a new picture. I've gone with the slow and steady picture of the tortoise and the hare the past couple years because it was so cute. Uh, but this year, I want to highlight our partnership with the Champaign County Master Gardeners, who came in and, and renovated completely Megan's Garden, which is on the north side of the building that you can see out from the children's department. We've got the wonderful mural there from Glenn Davies, and they created a new garden that f winds itself into the mural. It's really beautiful. Diane was there for the grand opening ceremony, and we were delighted. This year, we had over 28,000 people attending 814 programs. The library has just over 11,500 card holders. We had checkouts of over 600, sorry, 760,000 items. We answered over 57,400 reference questions. O almost 43,000 people used the computers, or I should say there were 43,000 computer uses probably by some of the same people sometimes, um, for over 38,000 hours of internet access. Over 345,000 people came in and out of the doors, which means they were visiting downtown Urbana, many of them parking in the lot, but some biking, walking, and taking public transportation. We have meeting rooms that were used 560 times by the community, and we have two study rooms that were used over 2,000 times last fiscal year, and we had over 2,600 hours of volunteer time given to the library, and we are grateful for all of that. As of today, We've got almost 26,000 items checked out, uh, worth $532,000. And of those, over 1,000 are eBooks. We don't have a value on those because we get them in a package. But if you consider $20 a book, it's another $20,000 worth of value to our community checked out with their tax dollars that they didn't have to pay for. Some of these items are children's book that cost a few bucks. Some of these are things like telescopes, microscopes, guitars, banjos, mandolins. So um, all kinds of things that can be checked by our patrons and are being checked out. It was a big year for facilities for the library. Um, we have some great pictures of the chiller being replaced on the rooftop, and we are very happy to have a more energy efficient chiller that we know is not going to fail on us at any given moment. So we are, um, again, grateful for the help of City Legal and Public Works, without whom we would not have been able to work through this process, the RFP process and such. And we're grateful to the generosity of our community and the Urbana Free Library Foundation which paid for the new chiller and um, compressor that were replaced. We celebrated our 100 years on the location of the Samuel T. Busey Memorial Library, and our porch was also 100 years old, and you can see there was some settling and some cracking and some leaking and a hole that was created. So we are very happy that through the Foundation's generosity again, the porch was completely rebuilt and put back to its former glory. And we are happy to have the awnings up, the flower boxes filled, and people using the porch all the time. Now, new porch furniture. In addition, the library replaced the air handler unit and um, you know, furnace AC on one of our rental units in the Weber Thieves building that we own across the street at the southwest corner of Race and Green. And now we have four tenants in the building, so it's fully rented out, which is good to have more businesses downtown. Magic Needle, which had been located up at one of the other developments that's happening, relocated here, and we're delighted to have them. Also being energy efficient, we're switching out to LED light bulbs throughout the building. We've got over 1,000 replaced, another 2,500 to go. We expect to get that done this fiscal year, but that should save us time and money in a number of ways as well. The foundation had a wonderful donor appreciation event. May thank you. Uh, May 18th to say thank you, Urbana, for the love. Again, these projects were very expensive and people in the community were generous. And so we had um, uh, different ways to thank them and wonderful musicians coming to sing. And then um, Diane cut the ribbon so we could grand opening on the porch. It was fun. We've been par um, participants in a number of great activities this year. We had a lot of partners, as I mentioned. We partnered with the Up Center with the Drag Queen Story Hours, which have been super exciting and very popular. We were also a partner on a National Education Award um, Big Read Grant. It's a, a national program. We worked with the Spurlock Museum. And we had a bunch of different programs featuring Indian dance and music. We hosted thematic book discussions, thematic book discussions, Bengali embroidery, and henna painting activities in the Teen Open Lab. And we have panel discussions focusing on immigration and the experiences of women and teens. 
and this is a National Endowment for the Arts Big Read grant through the um, partnership with Arts Midwest. We listen to our patrons and we try to give them what they want and what they said they wanted this year are more of these quote unquote new collections, these specialized things that you might not expect to see in a library. They ask for children's developmental toys because your kids grow quickly and they um, grow out of some activities and into new ones and those things can be expensive and they take a lot of space in your house. And you need them for a limited time span. So the library is a perfect place to share those kinds of items. So we've got a, a list of the different age groups that one might find oneself at and the items are color coded. You see the second picture on the right with one item on the shelf. That's because everything else was checked out that day. Um, but feel free to place a hold. We've got things like the little bobbly things where you can ring stackers, color shapes, sizes, and then the seek and discovery ball where different types of items are stuffed into the little ball, which is kind of um, fuzzy. So kids have different tactile experiences as they're learning shapes, colors, and then how to manipulate their fingers. We had other new collections this year. I'm gonna go back to the cool pictures there. We are working with um, a project called Explore More Illinois so that you can check out discounted and free passes to participating museums, science centers, sporting events, zoos, park districts, theaters, and more. So if you go to our website, type in your card number, you can see the list of different participating um, organizations and get free and discounted tickets so you can have different experiences in the world. We now have uh, offerings for the New York Times Online Canopy and Hoopla, which we've talked about, which are streaming and downloadable books and videos and music and graphic novels and have been very popular. We also have a mobile hotspot collection, which we're going to be expanding this year thanks to the foundation. So if you don't have a hotspot at home or you want to take one on vacation, you can do that. And the, found, the Champaign County Historical Archives added another 100 finding aids for special collections, including the Sydney Historical Society's Oral History Project, We've got the Frank Heitzman's Architectural Survey of Champaign-Urbana, a new collection of records. So we've got more finding aids so you can find what we have and new collections to be found. In addition, because of the wonderful Urbana Sculpture Project, on the corner lot we have a new sculpture called Races. And we had a grand opening of that at back in the fall. And what was great about this is it's beautiful art. It's a wonderful space for it. And the race, the Illinois Marathon, went by it. So all the runners got to see it. And the artists let us dress the sculpture up. And so they had race bibs and such. And it was a lot of fun. It was, it was whimsical and wonderful. The archive staff have been super busy continuing to work on processing the Chanute Air Force Base Museum collection. So we have discovered information on the base and department histories. We've got building records, oral histories, photographs, scrapbooks, and a technical training collection. So the foundation pays for one intern 10 hours a week from the library school. The library pays for one intern 10 hours a week from the library school. And they continue to process the collection to make it more available and accessible. The Teen Open Lab continues to be a great success. We get between 25 and 50 students coming in after school every day. Uh, it celebrated its six year anniversary this year and we've had over 23,500 visits by teens. So that has been a really popular, powerful place. It's self-directed and um, we learn from the kids all the time. Next on the agenda of the library board is to continue working on the strategic planning process. We expect to have a new strategic plan by the end of the year. We're hoping for um, December, perhaps January. And then we're going to continue next year working on the, um, our capital plan projects. And one of our projects for next year is the staff parking lot, which is just our wreck. And so we are going to be um, working on getting that completely replaced. There's a lot of information in your packets, but I know you've got a busy agenda. So um, do you have any questions? Any questions for Celeste? Thank you. I do know some of us in the room today uh, attended the District 116 um, all district staff meeting for teachers and faculty for this new year. And we heard from Dr. Jennifer Ivory Tatum on the importance of education early in life and um, the role that places like the library can play helping parents get their children ready for kindergarten. We have a lot of kids in this town who arrive at the door of kindergarten without ever having opened a book 
or um, any experiences that some of us take for granted. So the library has a very important role to play in that, and I thank you very much. Thank you. All right, under unfinished business, we have a um, update, an update from Urbana Public Television. This uh, follows up on a report that we received earlier in the year. There's no council action to be taken tonight. This is simply an informational update, an opportunity to um, ask questions. So Jason Liggett from UPTV will be making this presentation. Also, here are Jake Schumacher and uh, Sanford Hess, Director of IT. Good evening, Council. Uh, if you will remember back in February, we updated you on a plan that we were uh, undertaking to look into the feasibility and logistics of launching a new public access channel and reaching out to community organizations to see if they'd be interested in running that public access channel. One of the questions that I get right away is, wait a minute, what are you going to put on the public access channel? What's going to go on the government and education channel? Uh, so this is just a very small portion of our program. If I was to put all of the programs we were on UPTV, it would be a 32 slides or two point font, but uh, neither one ideal in this scenario. So just for the government and education access side of things, we're still gonna run all the city council meetings, the various boards and commissions. Uh, we also partner with the Housing Authority and the Board of Education and the Urbana Park District and uh, the Urbana Free Library Board, as well as all the boards and commissions that we have. We also do a number of uh, city informational videos. Uh, we do promotional videos for the sweet corn that we just released, things of that nature, as well as in for the education access, we work with the Urbana High School journalism class to produce uh, sporting events and teach the students how to run those as well as uh, high school graduation and middle school eighth grade promotion ceremonies. All of that will continue to run on the government and education access channel which would continue to be ran by city staff. On the public access channel you'd kind of see everything else. It would be all of our religious and church programs, all of our uh, news and commentary programs, uh, any sort of uh, partnership we have such as uh, WPTU, we work with uh, the students there to produce a video version of their radio sports talk show. Uh, we work with Dave Monk to produce the Prairie Monk, anything along those lines. Jake does a wonderful job of downloading a number of community programs from other communities that uh, our viewers might uh, find interesting as well, and those would run on the separate public access channel. I met with representatives from Comcast to see whenever we, if we were to request a fifth channel, what would that process look like? Uh, Comcast has 30 days to provide the city with the cost of launching the channel. That cost uh, would include a transmitter and a receiver, uh, right now valued at $1,750, so a minimal cost there. The city or the organization taking over the new public access channel would need to cover the cost of any fiber installation. In our franchise agreement with Comcast, there are certain head-ins that we have access to. So one is here at 400 South Vine, which is running this channel. Another one is at 205 North Race. So there's a potential for a partnership. Right now, that head-end at 205 North Race, which is the district central office, is not being used because we have a dedicated fiber line from the city to the school district. So it could be a scenario where we partner with the school district to house a head-end there for the new channel or we would need to uh, cover the cost of any fiber build out uh, from the Comcast network. The channel location would be in the three digit tier, which means it would be somewhere between 100 and 999 for the new channel. Uh, that would be available on the digital starter package um, or the basic <laughs> starter package from Comcast. Once we make a formal request to Comcast, they would have 120 days to make that channel available on those packages. I also met with I3 Broadband. We have a similar agreement with ITV3, now I3 Broadband. Uh, they have 30 days to provide the city with the cost of launching the channel. Uh, right now, again, they, are, uh, they have uh, the, in the uh, encoder that runs uh, channel on I3 that we would need to cover the cost for or the organization would need to cover the cost for. We would also need to cover the cost of any fiber installation that if an organization were not on the I3 network. If they're on the I3 network, meaning they have I3 fiber running through their building, not necessarily they're subscribing to their uh, internet package, but that means we would not uh, 
need any further costs associated with building out into that network. The city can choose the channel location as long as it's not already home to another channel. Uh, the uh, HD channel would be in the 400 range, whereas the SD channel would be in the 0 to 399 range. So in a scenario similar to WAND, channel 17 is WAND SD, but if you were to turn to 417, that's HD in, uh, on I3 broadband. So you are hearing me correct, I3 broadband would uh, allow an HD channel uh, for the new channel. I also met with representatives from AT&T UVerse. Uh, the city would need to fill out and submit a PEG service request form at least three months in advance. Uh, there's no anticipated costs. IT or AT&T would cover any encoder and transmitter costs as they did when they first installed the city's channel uh, back in 2009. Uh, there may be additional costs that will later be uh, determined by the AT&T engineering team, although my preliminary discussions with them is they don't see anything uh, too costly coming from that. The new channel would be part of the PEG channel lineup on channel 99. So right now, AT&T UVerse has one channel for all the PEG channels. So if you turn to 99, you're presented with a menu, and then from that menu, you can choose the various PEG channels. So it would be treated in the same manner that all of our other PEG channels in town is treated. We wanted to make sure that we got feedback not only from the community, which was included in the memo in your packet, but also the UPTV membership. The people that will be most directly affected by this are the people who are producing the shows that air on our channel, as well as our viewers. Um, when we met with our membership back in February, one of their main concerns was the need for space. They have always been very appreciative of the space that the city has provided, but it is, you know, 120 square foot you know, storage closet off the side of the uh, council chambers that we make work and, and they're very appreciative of that. But one thing that they mentioned is they not only want a smaller studio like that, but perhaps a larger studio and something even more along the lines thinking in the future of a more of a performance venue. So they could hold, you know, panel discussions or concerts or things of that nature there. Uh, they also wanted to maximize our viewing audience. So we do a pretty good job of that now. We live stream 24-7, we put a number of our programs on our YouTube channel and uh, do a good job of advertising all that on social media. They also want to see us reach out to other community uh, cable providers such as Mediacom, which provides service to Rantoul, uh, and perhaps even reaching out to Comcast to see what it would take to go over into Vermilion County, because right now we're just covering Champaign County uh, communities uh, on Comcast. They also wanted to see increased partnerships with other media organizations. And one key thing that they said, it needs to have a stable funding source. So they don't want to see it go to another organization and that organization not be able to support it because that doesn't really you know, solve any of the issues. That just kind of terminates it. Uh, that's also one of the main concerns that the UPTV Commission had when this was brought to the UPTV Commission back in June. Uh, they're very fond of the public access product and the public access service that we've been able to provide over the years, and they want to see that continue in our community. And they're open to ideas of what that may look like, but their main concern is if an organization is going to run the access channel, they want to see funding go along with that uh, from the city to support that. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions here tonight. As the mayor mentioned, Sanford Hess and Jake Schumacher are also here to answer any questions. Our next time that we will see you uh, concerning this process is in January. Uh, between now and then, I've been meeting with a number of community organizations to gauge their interest. In January, we hope to uh, have a recommendation for the best partner to take over public access television services. We are uh, going to meet with our membership in December, as well as the UPTV Commission will meet next month in September and also in December to discuss these items. With that, I'm happy to take any questions. If you can hold just a minute, I do have one member of the public who wants to make comments, and then we'll, we'll take questions for yeah, you all. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's Daryl Cruz. Amy, 
Maybe I should start talking before Charlie starts the clock. <laughs> You've been around too long, Daryl. <laughs> too long, huh? Maybe that would help. Uh, first of all, I would like to second everything that Danielle said. And I think you have received emails from me regarding my concerns and interests in this particular topic and issue. But I would like to read a statement to you this evening and I've included some documents that the city has provided me in my review of this particular issue. First of all, I have great respect for the UPTV staff and what they've accomplished in recent years. The community should, and I know they do take great pride in programming and expansion on the three pegs of UPTV, public, educational, and governmental programming. But I'm here tonight simply because I don't understand why the city has even undertaken this process. And I am fearful the outcome will lead to a conflict decision to discontinue public access, that meaning city support or city council support. On page three of the city's proposal, it simply states, should a partner not be found, then I assume we refers to the city staff will request that the city council either increase funding for UPTV or consent to eliminate public and educational programming, quote. The public needs to be aware of this treacherous path that the city council has allowed the staff to take. And certainly the council needs, or certainly knows there are other options available. In short, I fear the commitments of previous councils and mayors to protect and support public access for the community are being abdicated by city staff under the guise of appearing to be fiscally responsible. Yet this supposed and reason appears very questionable, and that is what I wish to speak tonight is the finances. Of course, there are a whole host of other issues or problems <coughs> regarding, but just let's look at finances this evening. First, look into revenues. In 2000, 2000 fiscal year 2018, the city received over $528,000, that's a half a million dollars in franchise and peg fees of which any portion can be used to support UPTV and I have the high end out that the city supplied. Secondly, the proposed city budget for this fiscal year only shows a deficit of $2,043 while carrying an ending fund balance of $112,000. The mayor stated that a combined $31,600 is earmarked for equipment improvements in 2020 and 2022, leaving over $80,000 or enough money to cover the 2020 budget deficit and any deficit or increases for the near future. Thirdly, Mr. Ligon has shown, and I think he made this presentation to the UPTV Commission, I assume you received this document, a chart entitled Possible Staff for a Separate Public Access Channel to show an organization what it might cost to uh, staff a public access channel. And that's attached on the back as handout three. And he suggests a program manager, and I'm taking the highest cost scenario, working 30 hours a week and $15 would cost the community organization only $23,000. My question is, why doesn't the city itself consider this option? The difference between retired Mr. Schumacher's fiscal year 18 salary and this option is tens of thousands of dollars. What is ironic about this process is that while the city has dedicated revenue streams for UTPV, that's over a half million dollars for staffing and program, it is not, not offering any community organization one penny of ongoing. I think there were ongoing financial support. I would ask the city, <clears throat> I would ask if the city with over a half million dollars of an annual franchise and peg fees feels unable to maintain public access, how do you reasonably expect a nonprofit or community organization with no dedicated annual revenue or profit stream or, or revenue stream to do so? In addition, a community organization has no intrinsic value or reason to perfect, protect public access in the long term, which is a, a whole other issue we can talk about in the future. 
is why would they even do it? How do you guarantee it? Therefore, I would encourage the city to simply halt this misguided process, maintain your past commitments to the community to support and protect UPTV, especially public access, by simply using Mr. Shoemaker's current salary, part-time position, and salary to hire a member whose responsibility solely would be public access. And I think the money's there. And it really seems like a waste of staff time and city money. Thank you very much. And if there are technical questions for staff, um, Jason is here as well as Sanford has. Bill. Um, so as far as this next phase of getting proposals from other organizations, have you ruled out the possibility of ongoing financial support from the city or could that be part of their proposal? We haven't ruled out anything. Um, we're open to any sort of proposal that the community organizations, uh, you know, want, want to come forward with. And I've communicated that to uh, the community organizations that have, uh, have taken an interest. Okay, so I'd expect some of the organizations to say we would do it if we could get so much in, annual support or something. In, in fact, every organization that I contacted, their first question to me was, does this come with funding? So yeah. Okay, that's kind we're of we're all in the same ballpark there. I just wanted to make sure I was clear on that. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next up we have reports of standing committees from uh, the report out by Council Member Jared Miller. And I do have, oh, go ahead, I do have one public input for the first item. Okay. Uh, last week, the Committee of the Whole met and we moved a number of ordinances uh, forward to the full council, most with uh, recommendations for approval. The first of which was uh, ordinance number 2019-08-043, an ordinance amending Urbana City Code, chapter 9.5, article two, having to do with raffles. Uh, on behalf of the committee, I move uh, approval of this ordinance. I'll second. Moved by Jared, seconded by Mary Alice. And before we entertain discussion, um, I have a public input card from John Maggio from the VFW. Thank you for coming. Thank you. All right. Um, I will announce to the public that after, in, in uh, response to questions that council member raised at the meeting last week, um, staff did provide information regarding um, bingo games, maximum value of all prizes awarded in a single raffle. You were, we were asked to look at other communities and as well as penalties for violating the Urbana um, ordinance. There was also a question about um, could the city uh, set a maximum um, split as listed, add a maximum split to the ordinance. So in response to um, comments that I've received and after uh, further thought we did modify the proposed ordinance and you have a copy of it in front of you if you wish to amend the ordinance that you passed last week we added to section 9.5-23 maximum value of prizes and the sentence that was added reads the retail value of all prizes or merchandise awarded by a licensee in a single raffle shall not exceed one million dollars so that does set a maximum level for the prize awarded. Otherwise, the ordinance that you received um, is exactly the same as you passed last week. So I guess at this point, are there any questions or comments? Mary Alice. Um, I just wanted to publicly thank the staff uh, and the uh, lawyer, I believe it was Kurt who, who looked into this issue um, for your time um, and input into this. I'm, I'm satisfied that we have some guarantees. Um, so I'm certainly willing to support this change. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. Do we need a uh, um, move of so you will amendment need, for? Yeah, you'll need to amend okay. the ordinance you have in front of you. Uh, I move passage of uh, the amended ordinance. Uh, I think it's just the red that's in our copy that's different from before, where we added the. Uh, the only thing the different, the only, yeah. The only thing different from what you passed out of committee last week is section 9.5-23, the one sentence related to maximum value of prizes. So that would be what you would add, Charlie. The appropriate motion would be to move to amend the motion that's on the floor, which is last week's version, adding that sentence. Okay. Uh, I will move uh, to amend the motion sent forward from uh, the committee uh, that includes uh, the sentence and the change of the third value for all prizes less than 5000 for the fee to be reduced to $10. No, that's not what was amended. Not that one? No. Am I looking at the wrong no. thing? 9.523. 9 9 you want to go to oh, Exhibit I'm A. I'm sorry. Section 9.5-23. Okay. And that is the retail value of all prizes or merchandise awarded by a licensee in a single raffle shall not exceed one million dollars. As the mayor said. <laughs> I, I will second that. Okay, the motion has uh, the motion has been made to amend the motion on the floor as uh, amended in section 9.5-23. Will the clerk please call the roll? Uh, we need a uh, just a voice vote on the amendment first okay. and then a roll call. Is there a motion to support this amendment? They moved the we amendment. Do we need a, a voice vote? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. We don't do this often. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now we'll vote on the main motion. Okay. Will the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Brown? Yes. Yes. Hazen? Yes. Um, Miller? Yes. Woo. Yes. <coughs> that motion passes. All right. Up next uh, was ordinance number 2019-08-044, an ordinance amending Schedule J of Section 23-183 of the Urbana Local Traffic Code prohibiting parking at all times on certain streets concerning Springfield Avenue at Busey Avenue. And this is a reduction of two uh, parking spaces to allow for more visibility. On behalf of uh, the committee, I move approval. A second. Moved by Jared, seconded by Bill. Any discussion? Will the clerk please call the roll? Council members Brown? Yes. Hazen? Yes. Miller? Yes. And Wu? Yes. That motion passes. All right. Finally, we have uh, ordinance number 2019-08-045, an ordinance amending Schedule M of Section 23-190 of the Urbana Local Traffic Code to establish a towway zone in a specified place on a certain street at the end of Baronry Drive uh, to allow for uh, or snow plows to be able to turn around at the end of that road. On behalf of the committee, I move approval. Is there a second? A moved by Jared, seconded by Bill. Any discussion? Will the clerk please call the roll? Council members Brown? Yes. Hazen? Yes. Miller? Yes. And Wu? Yes. That motion passes. And that concludes um, the report from the Standing Committee. We'll bring back the liquor ordinance to you at a later date. And are there any reports of special committees? Reports of officers? Under new business, I have one item, and that is an appointment to the um, Civilian Police <coughs> Review Board. I'd like to nominate Daryl Price, who's a resident of Urbana, a retired attorney at law. He has a lifelong interest in law enforcement and wants to make a positive impact on and contribution to the Urbana community. His term would end June 30th, 2022. Is there a motion for approval? So moved. I'll second. Moved by Mary Alice, seconded by Dean. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion passes. All right. That brings us to the last item on the agenda, which is 
the public listening session on recreational marijuana sales in the city of Urbana. I do have a short statement that provides some context to what we're doing here tonight. Then we'll take public input and um, hear what everyone has to say. So the purpose of this listening session is to solicit public input on the sale of recreational cannabis in the city of Urbana. This uh, context is as follows. A new state law legalizes the use of recreational cannabis in the state of Illinois beginning January 1st, 2020. Local governments may not prohibit the use of recreational cannabis, but may prohibit its sale and or regulate the location of dispensaries. Local governments may also impose a tax in addition to state sales taxes on recreational cannabis in an amount up to 3% of the purchase price. The current medical cannabis dispensary located on University Avenue will be permitted to operate a recreational dispensary at the same location beginning January 1st if there's no action by the city to prohibit that. Other dispensaries may be licensed by the state in the future. Prior to location of additional dispensaries in the city, the city council will engage or would engage in a discussion on regulating locations through an amendment to the zoning ordinance. For each local dispensary, a 3% cannabis excise tax is expected to generate $150,000 to $300,000 in revenue from this 3% tax, in addition to applicable state and home rule sales taxes of $125,000 to $250,000. So we're looking at a total of $275,000 to $550,000 a year for each dispensary. As you may know, city resources have been stretched over the past few years, resulting in the elimination of more than 10 full-time equivalent positions. As we look ahead to fiscal year 2021, as part of our ongoing um, plan to eliminate our structural budget deficit, we're looking at an 807, uh, estimated $875,000 gap that we're going to need to fill. Without new revenue, further cuts will be required in the upcoming fiscal year. Revenue from local cannabis sales and other revenue sources that we'll be looking at could help address the budget gap and provide vital city services. And we are at the point at looking at city services. In November 2016, an advisory referendum was placed on the ballot for Cunningham Township, whose boundaries are coterminous with the city of Urbana. The question, quote, shall the state of Illinois legalize and regulate the sale and use of marijuana in a similar fashion as the state of Colorado, end quote, resulted in 11,863 yes votes and 3,804 no votes. More than 75% of voters on this question were in favor of legalization. So prior to consideration of a tax on recreational cannabis, which is expected to take place on August 26th, that's next week, September 3rd, the City Council would like to hear your input on permitting the sale of recreational cannabis in the City of Urbana, any other questions and concerns that we will need to address in the coming months. I would like to uh, remind folks that this is a listening session. It's not an item listed as a discussion item on our agenda, so the Council will not be discussing this tonight. Um, we do have three Council members absent due to travel and work, so this this is an opportunity for us all to listen to what you have to say. So if you want to address the council, be sure you fill out one of the green cards. They're in the back of the room. Um, and I'll start just a call. This is not a public hearing, but do when you please, please state your name when you come up to the table to speak. First up is uh, Taylor Dent. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, I actually just um, recently moved back from the Washington, D.C. area in which recreational cannabis has been um, passed for about 10 years now. Um, so one of my um, biggest uh, concerns with um, the bill um, on a state level, and then I'll break that down to uh, a uh, county level, was um, the equity um, regarding who can leverage the opportunities um, in selling and being in the can of business. Uh, so I, one of my questions is, um, 
will there be any um, incentives or any um, push from the city of Urbana to try and um, create access for small businesses to get ahead and to have our own dispensaries. Um, I know that there is a medical dispensary already here. You just stated maybe somewhere on University Avenue. Um, but what I think is most important is trying to um, get the community involved in um, making more local businesses so that our money that um, we make from recreational use stays here. Um, so that we can continue to generate more money for um, our city um, necessities and for our payrolls um, while um, actually giving people more of a business opportunity um, for the people who buy and contribute to this community when it comes to taxing and things um, of the sorts. Um, another uh, question that I had was, um, being that there is actually um, like a $30 million grant program at which small businesses can, um, they can apply for um, like statewide, um, is there going to be anything by implemented by the city of Urbana that will actually break the law into layman's terms? We have a lot of people that do want to learn more about how we can um, use this legally, how we can um, sell legally um, while being in ordinance, uh, but we don't all have the same educational access or, um, you know, the same IQ to be able to break down such uh, dense text that we get online. So I, I just want to know, will there be anything um, that will be implemented by the city of Urbana to kind of raise um, red flags or something like that so people can kind of know what's going on and just stay abreast? Because as we know, um, everything is all about knowledge and um, access to opportunity here. Um, another thing I wanted to know, um, being that there's a 3% um, tax on um, recreational uh, marijuana that will be being sold. Is there any um, plan or any um, set percentage that will go into the school system here um, where there's just kind of, um, how can I say this, unlocked funds that can be funneled into the school system that can directly um, impact the students positively? I mean, um, and then I also, wanted to know, I don't know if this is the, a meeting um, in which this can be talked about or whatever, um, will there be any, um, will there be any push from the city of Urbana or um, Champaign County for the University of Illinois and other um, big corporations that um, get large tax breaks here to try to implement um, programs at which the local members of the community can kind of learn more about growing or learn more about um, starting small businesses, think workshops and things that can be put in place. Because if we can kind of really put everybody and give everybody a seat at the table, we can all really eat here, here off of this really well. Um, so my um, biggest concern is um, equity, uh, diversity in, in, in the business, not just um, being on the receiving end and buying um, into cannabis, but being able to sell uh, cannabis legally. And, and that's uh, my piece. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mike Lehman. Hi, I'm Mike Lehman. I've been before the council before. I don't know on this particular issue, but uh, I've worked on this issue for many years. This goes back to about 1990 in this town. It's a Jack Harrar uh, shirt he sold when he was coming through town, working on some of his books. If you know anything about cannabis, this is the guy that kind of supposedly wrote the Bible on it. Uh, with the assistance of a friend of mine, Josh Sloan, who was uh, head of the student normal chapter, I believe at the time, who sort of showed him where to look in the U of I archives about hemp cultivation back in the day. Um, I'll echo the sentiments of the young lady who came before me. Uh, this is a real opportunity for, uh, I think, Urbana. Uh, we're a town that sits in prime agricultural land. Uh, this is a town where there is expertise this is a town where people have done this over the years, whether or not it was a knowledge 
but it's certainly things that lead to economic development. Uh, towns that have embraced this, I think, have done well. Uh, there will be some, of course, people who maintain the traditional hysteria. And, you know, the state does have this pretty closely controlled, quite frankly. I don't think there's any reason to fear that somehow marijuana is going to be marching down Main Street or something like this. Some of the, the tales that you'll hear uh, undoubtedly uh, may come up, but probably not too much in Urbana. The vote, I think, uh, expresses people's sentiments. Obviously, there's a large population of students who may or may not be interested. I think, uh, I, I think you can overgeneralize about that. But I think it's also one of the things that there is demand in this town. It's not just people that live here, but people who come here for um, sporting events, things like that. Who knows where that's going to go? I think you'll eventually see uh, it treated a little bit more, uh, how we, shall we say, liberally by the state, uh, at least in the context of like where alcohol is. Because quite frankly, the more people probably that do uh, cannabis, it's probably going to lead to less problems on the street. Uh, you shouldn't mix the two, obviously, uh, but I think uh, they found that generally people, uh, you know, I listen to a police scanner from time to time. Uh, you listen on uh, weekends and you'll hear dozens of people some weekends being hauled away, alcohol intoxication, life-threatening uh, possibilities going on, man's vast amounts of public resources. If you ask the fire department and the police, I'm sure they'll tell you about that. Uh, Usually what you hear as far as cameras goes, well, somebody's stinking up the hall, you know, and maybe they shouldn't be doing it inside. Maybe that should be accommodated somehow or another. But I think that the scale of potential threat and harm to people, the demand for public resources, I think it's pretty clear. Uh, cannabis doesn't cause a problem now. Most people have access to cannabis, whether it's legal or not already. Uh, it hasn't been a problem. I don't foresee it being a problem. Uh, obviously, that can be dealt with. You know, people who are problem people are always problem people, no matter what they're doing. Uh, they could be doing nothing and be problem people. But you know, it's one of these things where I, I think uh, Urbana can really set the tone here and how they go about dealing with these recreational sales. And I think it's good to keep in mind that there are uh, people in this community who have been impacted by this, uh, and uh, that it would be good to at least acknowledge this. I think Urbana has had a long tradition of making sure everybody has access to public resources, and I think you all will do a good job at that if you think about it a little bit. Uh, that's enough to be said anyway, and I thank you for your time and your support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, David Rogers. Mayor and Council, I'm David Rogers from Urbana. I have a conscience responsibility to speak on this subject uh, for s several reasons. <clears throat> One is I'm the Executive Director of Lifeline Connect Residential Recovery Center for men recovering from substance abuse and addiction. With about 30 years of experience, I have the privilege of helping families recover from the devastation of drug abuse. And for the last 13 years with Lifeline Connect, in a more specific way with men and their families recovering from uh, the destructive results of substance abuse. So my concern is this, and the reason I say I have a concern is that in our interview process, our intake process, our assessment and case studies, 95% of our clients in their story of how they got to heroin addiction, meth addiction, and so forth, the common thread is they first used marijuana. And they will tell you it's the gateway to more severe drug use. 
Uh, I have the unfortunate experience in the field of labor that we're in to stand by caskets of 20-some-year-old men. And I heard their story before they got there. And they said it all started with weed. And then it was other things. And then heroin. And we know we have a heroin epidemic. And it's not uh, absent in this county or in this city. So I have that knowledge. That's why I have a conscience responsibility here to, to say that I'm opposed to more accessibility to marijuana in any form, in any source. Secondly, uh, I recently, with all the talk of legalization of marijuana in Illinois, I interviewed all the uh, former heroin addicts that I have access to, and many of them are my personal friends. And I asked them, what would you do with government issued, legalized, accessible marijuana? What would you do with it if you were either prescribed it or had access to buy it, recreational marijuana. And every former heroin addict told me they would sell that on the street for more heroin. So my prediction is that more accessibility to marijuana on our streets of Urbana from any source are going to contribute to more heroin use, more crime that's associated with drug abuse. And so uh, to the Honorable Council and Mayor, uh, as a servant of your community, I wanted to bring that vein of thought uh, to say that there are some of us that are opposed to the sales of recreational marijuana within our city and our community. And my greatest concern is children, young people, with more accessibility, the more children and young people will have using marijuana Whatever the, the law is written, it's going to be accessible more. And those are the people that I see in what we do in our line of work, trying to help them recover from the devastation of drug use. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you. Mark Fitzgerald. Hello, I'm Mark Fitzgerald. I've been a resident of Urbana for 35 years, and I have some comments on the thing. Uh, it seems incomprehensible to me that in a community where alcohol, which is rated among the most dangerous drugs in the world, is sold everywhere and with a minimum of scrutiny and security, and yet we have hand-wringing over the sale of a benign and medicinal product. Marijuana will be sold in secure locations dedicated only to that product, and that is vastly superior to our treatment of alcohol, where frozen daiquiris are sold cheek to jowl with push-up kitty pops. I'd like to point out what should be obvious to anyone who has studied the prohibition of marijuana. From Anslinger to Nixon, the criminalization of marijuana has always been based on lies, fear-mongering, racism, and political skullduggery, and never on fact. We have the opportunity today both to right a historic wrong and properly regulate for adult use a product that today is totally unregulated, and I suggest that we take it. And if I have a second left, I guess I do, <laughs> I, I just, uh, when I see the people talk about recreational marijuana, we don't talk about recreational alcohol or recreational heroin. I think if you're just talking about adult use, there are a lot of people today who cannot, um, either they don't um, come under the state um, prescriptions for medical use or they're unwilling to jump through the hoops or go through all to the expense of getting the medical card. And I think if we allowed adult use, that people could make their own choices on this and uh, use it as they see fit as an adult. And that's pretty much what I have to say. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, next up is Les Cotton. Good evening, Council. My name is Les Cotton, and I'm on the board of Lifeline Connect, also the pastor of Apostolic Life Church. I'm also a graduate of Lifeline, uh, celebrating over 10 years of sobriety. And thank you for allowing me the time to address my concerns about recreational sales in the city of Urbana. Uh, as we all know, Colorado, Washington, they were the first states to pass recreational marijuana sale. And recently, Colorado Division of Criminal Justice Office of Research and Statistics released a study and it was entitled Impacts on Marijuana Legalization in Colorado. And this report, it just simply compiles, analyzes data on marijuana-related topics such as crime, impaired driving, hospitalizations, ER visits, usage rates, effects on youth, and more. And the purpose of this study was really to develop a baseline to spot trends so the leaders of Colorado could see where they were being effective and areas that they needed uh, to improve. And here were some of the results from the study that caught my attention. According to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, statistics would show the number of drivers in fatal accidents who tested positive for marijuana grew from 10% in 2013 to 20% in 2016. Marijuana seizures by the U.S. Postal Inspection Service have increased steadily since 2010 from 15 parcels seized containing 57 pounds of marijuana in 2010 to 1,009 parcels containing 2,001 pounds in 2017. Concerning effects on high school students, marijuana was the single most common reason for school expulsions at 22% and law enforcement referrals at 24%. From 2013 to 2017, there was a 12.2% increase in the homeless population. And according to the CT CDC, marijuana users are three times more likely to become addicted to heroin. And the CDC estimates that the total economic burden of opioid misuse alone in the U.S. is $78.5 billion a year when you add in the cost of health care, loss of productivity, addiction treatment, and criminal justice involvement. And in 2017, Champaign County had 28 deaths from opioid overdose. And it has been our experience with Lifeline Connect that hands down the majority of our men that struggle with addiction, marijuana was their gateway to harder drugs, including myself. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I have a card from Brenda Rogers on recreational cannabis sales. She chooses not to address the members, but her position to be entered into the record as in opposition. Um, the last card I have is Megan McDonald. Hi, Council. Thank you for taking the time to listen to us all tonight. Um, my name is Megan McDonald. I have lived in Champaign-Urbana for seven years. I, really, I received my bachelor's from U of I in 2016. I've worked around Champaign and Urbana, getting to know this community intimately. The reason I'm up here today is a result of moral responsibility, mental health advocacy, and white privilege. I am a rape survivor, a current client at Elliott Group Counseling, working through PTSD and the triggers that come along with that. I have overcome alcohol addiction, I went to months of group meetings. I am over 450 days sober. I say that while being a daily cannabis user. I have tried antidepressants, SSRIs, yoga, seasonal affective disorder lamps, therapy dogs, you name it. Any, uh, nothing has helped me, healed me, saved me the way that cannabis has. I have the privilege of standing up here today because I wasn't killed by my addiction or incarcerated for how I chose to personally medicate in my home. If you choose to not sell cannabis in city limits because of perpetuated stigma, racism, and propaganda, none of which is based in science that is tied to this plant, well, then I guess that's the route you'll take. But Urbana should take that tax money. There is no denial that people who need and want cannabis for medical and recreational reasons alike will get it regardless. 
There is no, no denial of the thousands of lives and generations of families traumatized for incarceration because for a nonviolent plant, because that is what the gateway is. It is trauma. It is not cannabis. The over-policing and the vilification of this plant has led to a limited art scene, closing mu music venues, and what is left is usually centered around beer, whiskey, or wine. Our communities deserve more options of recreation and medicine alike and less thin, thinly veiled racism. Thank you. Thank you. I also wanted to um, let folks know that I received an email from Elizabeth and David Feltz Olmsted, um, who express support for the sale of recreational cannabis in the city. And that will, their email will be entered into the record as well. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the city council? I do want to acknowledge we have in the audience Sean Albers, who um, is the um, agent in charge of the New Med um, dispensary in Urbana, and he'll be available after the meeting to answer individual questions. Thank you very much. Mayor, uh, just for the record, we did also receive an uh, email from Cheryl Bowie. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's it right. It came late this okay. evening. Okay, and that will be entered into the record as well. I thank you all for coming. There are many, many questions that still remain to be answered. Um, I will let people know that the Illinois Municipal League is preparing uh, FAQs, and they are trying to interpret the state law and put it into plain language so that people can understand, and we look forward to working with them on that. But thank you very much, and um, this, with no further business before this meeting, we stand adjourned.